Ship to Tarshish. The talk one evening turned on the metaphysics of courage. It's a subject which most men are a little shy of discussing. They will heartily applaud a friend's pluck, but it's curious how rarely they will label a man a coward. Perhaps the reason is that we're all odd mixtures of strength and weakness, brave in certain things, timid in others, and since each is apt to remember his private funks more vividly than the things about which he is bold, we are cherry about dogmatising. La Mancha propounded the thesis that everybody had a yellow streak in them. We all, he said, at times shirk unpleasant duties and invent an honourable explanation, which we know to be a lie. Sandy Arbuthnot observed that the most temerarious deeds were often done by people who had begun by funking, and then, in the shame of the rebound, did a good deal more than those who had no qualms. The man who says, I go not, and afterwards repents and goes, generally travels the devil of a long way. Like Jonah, said La Mancha, who didn't like the job allotted him, and took ship to Tarshish to get away from it, and then repented and went like a raging lion to Nineveh. Collett, who had been a sailor and one of the Q-boat heroes in the war, demurred. I wonder if Nineveh was as unpleasant as the whale's belly, he said. Then he told us a story in illustration, not as one would have expected out of his wild sea memories, but from his experience in the city, where he was now a bill-broker. I got to know Jim Halward first when he had just come down from the university. He was a tall, slim, fair-haired lad with a soft voice, and the kind of manners which make the ordinary man feel a lout. Eton and Christchurch had polished him till he fairly glistened. His clothes were sober works of art, and he was the cleanest thing you ever saw. Always seemed to have just shaved and bathed after a couple of hours' hard exercise. We all liked him, for he was a companionable soul and had no frills, but in the city he was about as useless as a lily in a quick-set hedge. Somebody called him an apolostic epicene, which sounded accurate, though I don't know what the words mean. He used to come down to business about eleven o'clock and leave at four, earlier in the summer when he played polo at Hurlingham. This lotus-eating existence lasted for two years. His father was the head of Halwards, the merchant bankers who had been in existence since before the Napoleonic Wars. It was an old-fashioned private firm with a tremendous reputation, but for some years it had been dropping a little out of the front rank. It had very few of the big issues, and though reckoned as solid as the Bank of England, it had hardly kept pace with new developments. But just about the time Jim came down from Oxford, his father seemed to get a new lease of life. Halward suddenly became ultra-progressive, took in a new manager from one of the big joint-stock banks, and launched out into business, which before it would not have touched with the end of a barge-pole. I fancy the old man wanted to pull up the firm before he died, so as to leave a good thing to his only child. In this new activity, Jim can't have been of much use. His other engagements didn't leave a great deal of time to master the complicated affairs of a house like Halward's. He spoke of his city connection with a certain distaste, the set he had got into were mostly elder sons with political ambitions, and if Jim had any serious inclination it was towards Parliament, which he proposed to enter in a year or two. For the rest he played polo and hunted, and did a little steeplechasing and danced assiduously. Dancing was about the only thing he did really well, for he was only a moderate horseman, and his politics were not to be taken seriously. So he was the complete flaneur, agreeable, popular, beautifully mannered, highly ornamental, and the most useless creature on earth. You see, he'd slacked at school, and had just scraped through college, and had never done a real piece of work in his life. In the autumn of 1925, whispers began to circulate about Halwards. It seemed that they were doing a very risky class of business, and people shrugged their shoulders but no one was prepared for the almighty crash which came at the beginning of the new year. The firm had been trying to get control of a colonial railway, and for this purpose was quietly buying up the ordinary stock. But an American group, with unlimited capital, was out on the same tack, and the result was that the price was forced up, and Halwards were foolish enough to go on buying. They borrowed up to the limit of their capacity, and called a halt too late. If the thing had been known in time, the city might have made an effort to keep the famous old firm on its legs, but it all came like a thunderclap. Halwards went down, 
the American group got their railway stock at knockout price, and old Mr. Howard, who had just been ailing for some months, had a stroke of paralysis and died. I was desperately sorry for Jim. The foundation of his world were upset, and he hadn't a notion what to do about it. You see, he didn't know the rudiments of the business, and he couldn't be made to understand it. He went about in a dream with staring, unseeing eyes like a puzzled child. At first he screwed himself up to a sort of effort. He had many friends who would help, he thought, and he made various suggestions, all of a bottomless futility. Very soon he found that his Mayfair popularity was no sort of asset to him. He must have realised that people were beginning to turn a colder eye on a pauper than on an eligible young man, and his overtures were probably met with curt refusals. Anyhow, in a week he had given up hope. He felt himself a criminal and behaved as such. He saw nobody but his solicitors, and when he met a friend in the street he turned and ran. A perfectly unreasonable sense of disgrace took possession of him, and there was a moment when I was afraid he might put an end to himself. This went on for the better part of a month, while I and one or two others were trying to save something from the smash. We put up a fund and bought some of the wreckage with the idea of getting together a little company to nurse it. It was important to do something, for though Jim was the only child his mother was dead, there were various elderly female relatives who had their incomes from Halwards. The firm had been much respected, and old Halward had been popular, and Jim had no enemies. There is a good deal of camaraderie in this city, and a lot of us were willing to combine and keep Jim going. We were all ready to help him. If only he'd sit down and put his back into the job. But that was just what Jim would not do. He had got a horror of the city, and felt a pariah whenever he met anyone who knew about the crash. He had eyes like a hunted hare's, and one couldn't get any sense out of him. I don't think he minded the change in his comforts, the end of polo and hunting and politics and the prospect of cheap lodgings and long office hours. I believe he welcomed all that as a kind of atonement. It was the disgrace of the thing that came between him and his sleep. He knew only enough of the city to have picked up a wrong notion of its standards and imagined that everybody was pointing a finger at him as a fool and possibly a crook. It was very little use reasoning with him. I pointed out that the right thing for him to do was to shoulder the burden and retrieve his father's credit. He laughed bitterly. Much good I'd be at that, he said. You know I'm a baby in business, although you're too polite to tell me so. You can have a try, I said. We'll all lend you a hand. It was no use. References to his father and the firm's ancient prestige and his old great-aunts only made him shiver. You could see that his misery had made him blind to argument. Then I began to lose my temper. I told him that it was his duty as a man to face the music. I asked what else he proposed to do. He said he meant to go to Canada and start life anew. He'd probably change his name. I got out of patience with his silliness. You're offered a chance here to make good, I told him. In Canada you'll have to find your chance, and how in God's name are you going to do it? You haven't been bred the right way to succeed in the Dominions. You'll probably starve. Quite likely was his dismal answer. I'll make my book for that. I don't mind anything, so long as I'm in a place where nobody knows me. Remember you're running away, I said, running away from what I consider your plain duty. You can't expect to win out if you begin by funking. I know, I know, he wailed. I am a coward. I said no more. But when a man is willing to admit that he is a card, his nerves have got the better of his reason. Well, the upshot was that Jim sailed for Canada with a little short of two hundred pounds in his pocket, what was left of his last allowance. He could have had plenty of introductions, but he wouldn't take them. He seemed to be determined to bury himself, and, I dare say, too, he got a morbid satisfaction out of discomfort. He had still the absurd notion of disgrace— and felt that any handicap he laid in himself was a kind of atonement. He reached Montreal in the filthy weeks when the spring thaw begins, the worst sample of weather to be found on the globe. Jim had not procured any special outfit, and he landed with a kit consisting of two smart tweed suits, a suit of flannels, riding breeches, and knickerbockers, the remnants of his London wardrobe. It wasn't quite the rig for a poor man to go looking for a job in, 
He had travelled steerage, and, as might be expected from one of his condition, had not made friends. But he had struck up a tepid acquaintanceship with an Irishman who was employed in the lumber business. The fellow was friendly and was struck by Jim's obvious air of education and good breeding, so when he heard that he wanted work, he suggested that a clerkship might be got in his firm. Jim applied and was taken on as the clerk in charge of timber cutting rights in eastern Quebec. The work was purely mechanical and simply meant keeping a record of numbered lots, checking them off on a map, filling in the details in the register as they came to hand, but it required accuracy and strict attention and Jim had little of either. Besides, he wrote the vile fist, which is the special privilege of our public schools. He held down the job for a fortnight and then was fired. He'd found cheap lodgings in a boarding house down east and trudged the two miles in the slush to his office. His fellow lodgers were willing enough to be friendly, clerks and shop boys and typists and newspaper reporters, most of them, Jim wasn't a snob, but he was rapidly becoming a hermit, for all his nerves were exposed and he shrank from his fellows. His shyness was considered English swank, and the others invented nicknames for him and sniggered when he appeared. Luckily, he was too miserable to pay much attention. He had no interest in their games, their visits to the movies and the cheap dance halls, and their precocious sweethearting. He could not get the hang of their knowing commercial jargon. They set him down as a snob, and he shrank from them as barbarians. But there was one lodger, a sub-editor on a paper which I shall call the Evening Hawk, who saw a little further than the rest. He realised that Jim was an educated man, a scholar, he called it, and he managed to get part of his confidence. So when Jim lost his lumber job, he was offered a billet in the Hawk. There was no superfluity of men of his type in local journalism, and the editor thought he might give tone to his paper to have someone on the staff who could write decent English and keep them from making howlers about Europe. The Hawk was a lively, up-to-date production, very much Americanized in its traditions and its literary style, but it had just acquired some political influence and it hankered after more. But Jim was no sort of success in journalism. He was tried out in a variety of jobs as reporter, special correspondent, sub-editor, but he failed to give satisfaction in any. To begin with, he had no new sense. Not many things interested him in his present frame of mind, and he had no notion what would interest the Hawks readers. He couldn't compose snappy headlines, and it made him sick to try. His writing was no doubt a great deal more correct than that of his colleagues, but it was as dull as ditch water. To add to everything else, he was desperately casual. It was not that he meant to be slack, but that he had no stimulus to make him concentrate his attention, and he was about the worst sub-editor, I fancy, in the history of the press. Summer came, and sleet and icy winds gave place to dust and heat. Jim tramped the grilling streets, one vast ache of homesickness. He had to stick to his tweeds for this flannel suit had got lost in his journeys between boarding-houses, and as he mopped his brow in the airless newspaper room, smelling of printer's ink and shaken by the great presses, he thought of green lawns at Hurlingham and cool backwaters of the Isis and clipped yew hedges in old gardens and a pleasant club window overlooking St. James's Street. He hungered for fresh air, and when on a Sunday morning he went for a long walk, he found no pleasure in the adjacent countryside. It all seemed dusty and tousled and unhomely. He wasn't complaining, for it seemed to him part of a rightful expiation. But he was very lonely and miserable. I've said that he landed with a couple of hundred pounds, and this he'd managed to keep pretty well intact. One day, at a quick luncheon counter, he got into talk with a man called McNee a man at Tobin who had fought in the war and knew something about horses. McNee, like Jim, didn't take happily to town life and was very sick of his job with an automobile company and looking about for a better. There wasn't much in common between the two men except a dislike of Montreal, for I picture McNee as a rough diamond, an active, enterprising fellow meant by providence for a backwoodsman. He'd heard of a big dam somewhere down in the Gaspé district, which was being constructed in connection with a pulp scheme. He knew one of the foremen, and believed that money might be made by anyone who could put up a little capital and run a store in the construction camp. 
He told Jim it was a fine, wild country with plenty of game in the woods, and that besides making money easily, a storekeeper would have a white man's life. But every bit of a thousand dollars capital would be needed, and he could only lay his hands on a couple of hundred. To Jim, in his stuffy lodging house, the scheme offered a blessed escape. He wanted to make money. He wanted fresh air, and trees, and running water, for your Englishman, although town-bred, always hankers after the country. So he gave up his job on the hawk, just when it was about to give him up, and started out with McNee. The place was his first disappointment. It was an ugly clearing in an interminable forest of dull spruces, which ran without a break to New Brunswick. However far you walked, there was nothing to see except the low, muffled hills and the monotonous green of the firs. The partners were given a big shack for their store and made their sleeping quarters in one end of it. For stock they had laid in a quantity of tin goods, tobacco, shirts and socks and boots and a variety of musical instruments. But they found that most of their stuff was unmarketable, since the men were well fed and clothed by the company, and after a week their store had become a rough kind of café selling hot dogs and ice cream and soft drinks. McNee was immensely proud of it and ornamented the walls with ideal faces from the American magazines. He was a born restaurant keeper if he had got his chance, but unfortunately there wasn't much profit in Coca-Cola and ginger ale. In about a fortnight, the place became half eating house, half club, where the workmen gathered of an evening to play cards. McNee was in his element. But Jim was no more use than a sick pup. He didn't understand the lingo, and his shyness and absorption made him as unpopular as in the Montreal boarding houses. He saw his little capital slipping away, and there was no compensation in the way of a pleasant life. He tried to imitate McNee's air of hearty bonhomie and miserably failed. His partner was a good fellow and stood up for him when an irate navvy consigned him to perdition as a god-darn London dude, and Jim's own good temper and sense of only getting what he deserved did something to protect him. But he soon realised that he was a ghastly failure, and this knowledge prevented him from expostulating with the other for his obvious shortcomings. For McNee soon became too much of a social success. Gaspé was not dry, and there was more than soft drinks consumed in the store, especially by the joint proprietor and his friend the foreman. Also, McNeague was a bit of a gambler and was perpetually borrowing small sums from capital to meet his losses. Now and then Jim took a holiday and tramped all of a long summer day. The country around, being only partially surveyed, there was no map to be had, and he repeatedly lost himself. Once he struck a lumber camp and was given pork and beans by cheerful French Canadians whose patois he couldn't follow. Once he had almost a happy day when he saw his first moose, but generally he came back from stifling encounters with cedar swamps, weary but unrefreshed. He was not in the frame of mind to get much comfort out of the Canadian wilds, for he was always sore with longing for a different kind of landscape. The river on which the camp lay was the famous Mauche, Twelve miles down on the St. Lawrence shore was a big fishing lodge, owned by a rich New Yorker. Jim used to see members of the party, young men in marvellous knickerbockers, and young women in jumpers like Joseph's coat, and he hid himself at the sight of them. Occasionally a big roadster would pass the store, conveying fishermen to some of the upper lakes. Once when he was feeling especially dispirited after a long, hot day, a car stopped at the door, and two people descended. They came into the store, and the young man asked for a lemonade, declaring that their tongues were hanging out of their mouths. Happily, McNee was there to serve them, while Jim sheltered behind the curtain of his sleeping room. He knew them both. One was a subaltern in the cavalry with whom he played bridge in the club. The other was a girl whom he had danced with. Their workmanlike English clothes, their quiet, clear English voices gave him a bad dose of homesickness. They were returning, he reflected, to hot baths and cool, clean clothes and delicate food and civilised talk. For a moment he sickened at the sour, stale effluvia of the eating house and the rank smell of the pork which McNee had been frying. Then he cursed himself for a fool and a child. In the fall, the work on the dam was shut down, and the store was closed. 
The partners couldn't remove their unsaleable goods, so the whole stock was sold at junk prices among the nearest villages. Jim found himself with about $300 in the world, and a long Canadian winter to get through. The fall on the other side of the Atlantic is the pick of the year, and the beauty of the flaming hillsides did little to revive his spirits. McNee wanted to get back to Manitoba, where he'd heard of the job, and Jim decided that he would try Toronto, which was supposed to be rather more healthy for Englishmen than other cities. So the two travelled west together, and Jim insisted on paying McNee's fare to Winnipeg, thereby leaving himself a hundred and fifty dollars or so with which to face the world. Toronto is the friendliest place on earth for the man who knows how to make himself at home there. There were plenty to help him if he looked for them, for nowhere will you find more warm-hearted people to the square mile. But Jim's shyness and prickliness put him outside the pale. He made no effort to advertise the few assets he had. He was desperately uncommunicative, and his self-absorption was not unnaturally taken for side. Also, he made the mistake of letting himself get a little too far down in the social scale. His clothes had become very shabby, and his boots were bad. When the first snows came in November, he bought himself a thick overcoat, and that left no money to supplement the rest of his wardrobe, so that by Christmas he was a very good imitation of a tramp. He tried journalism first, but as he gave no information about himself, except that he had been for a few weeks in the Montreal Hawk, he had some difficulty in getting a job. At last he got work on a weekly rag, simply because he had some notion of grammar. It lasted exactly a fortnight. Then he tried tutoring, and spent some of his last dollars on advertising. He had several nibbles, but always fell down at the interviews. One kind of parent jibbed at his superior manners, another at his inferior clothes. After that he jilted from one temporary job to another. A book canvasser, an extra hand in a dry goods store on Christmas week, where the counter hid the deficiency of his raiment, a temporary clerk during a municipal election, a packer in a fancy stationery business, and finally a porter in a third-class hotel. His employment was not continuous, and between jobs he must have been nearly starving. He had begun in the ordinary cheap boarding house, but before he found quarters in the attic of the hotel he worked at, he had sunk to a pretty squalid kind of doss house. The physical discomfort was bad enough. He tramped the streets, ill-clad and half-fed, and saw prosperous people in furs and cheerful young parties and firelit, book-lined rooms. But the spiritual trouble was worse. Sometimes, when things were very bad, he was fortunate enough to have his thoughts narrowed down to the obtaining of food and warmth. But at other times he would be tormented by a feeling that his misfortunes were deserved, and that fate with a heavy hand was belabouring him because he was a coward. His trouble was no longer the idiotic sense of guilt about his father's bankruptcy. It was a much more rational penitence, for he was beginning to realise that I had been right, and that he'd behaved badly in running away from a plain duty. At first he choked down the thought, but all that miserable winter it grew upon him. His disasters were a direct visitation of the Almighty on one who had shown the white feather. He came to have an almost mystical feeling about it, he felt that he was branded like Cain, so that everybody knew that he'd funked. And yet he realised that a rotten, morbid pride ironly prevented him from retracing his steps. The second spring found him, thin from bad feeding and with a nasty cough. He had the sense to see that a summer in the hotel would be the end of him. So although he was in the depths of hopelessness, the instinct of self-preservation drove him to make a move. He wanted to get into the country, but it was impossible to get work on a farm from Toronto, and he had no money to pay for railway fares. In the end, he was taken on as a navvy on a bit of railway construction work in the wilds of northern Ontario. He was given the price of his ticket and ten dollars advance on his wages to get an outfit, and one day, late in April, he found himself dumped at a railhead on a blue lake, with furs, furs as far as the eye could reach. But it was springtime, the mating wildfowl were calling. The land was greening, and Jim drew long breaths of sweet air and felt that he was not going to die just yet. But the camp was a roughish place, and he had no McNee to protect him.
There was every kind of roughneck and deadbeat there, and Jim was a bad mixer. He was an obvious softy, and a new chum, and a natural butt. And since he was being tortured all the time by his conscience, his good nature and humble-mindedness were not so proof as he'd been in Gaspé. His poor physical condition made him a bad workman, and he came in for a good deal of abuse as a slacker from the huskies who wrought beside him. The section boss was an Irishman called Malone, with a tongue like a whiplash, and he found plenty of opportunities for practising his gift on Jim. But he was a just man, and after a bit of rough tonguing he saw that Jim was very white about the gills and told him to show his hands. Not being accustomed to the pick, these were one mass of sores. Malone cross-examined him and found that he'd been at college and took him off construction and put him in charge of stores. There he had an easier life, but he was more than ever the butt of the mess shack and the sleeping quarters. His crime was not only speaking with an English accent and looking like Little Willie, but being supposed to be a favourite of the boss. By and by, the ragging became unbearable, and after his mug of coffee had been three times struck out of his hand at one meal, Jim lost his temper and hit out. In the fight which followed, he was ridiculously outclassed. He had been fairly good at games, but he had never boxed since his private school. And it is well for Jim's kind of man to think twice before he takes on a fellow who has all his life earned his living by his muscles. But he stood up pluckily, and took a good deal of punishment before he was knocked out. He showed no ill will afterwards. The incident considerably improved his position. Malone, who heard of it, asked where in God's name he had been brought up, that he couldn't use his hands better, but didn't appear ill-pleased. The fight had another consequence. It gave him just a suspicion of self-confidence, and helped him on his way to the decision to which he was now slowly being compelled. A week later he was sent a hundred miles into the forest to take supplies to an advance survey party. It was something of a compliment that Malone should have picked him for the job. But Jim did not realise that. His brain was beating like a pendulum on his private trouble, that he had run away, that all his misfortunes were the punishment for his cowardice, and that though he confessed his fault, he couldn't make his shrinking flesh go back. He saw England as an Eden indeed, but with angels and flaming swords at every gate. He pictured the lifted eyebrows and the shrugged shoulders as he crept into a clerk's job, with not only his father's shame in his head, but the added disgrace of his own flight. It seemed impossible a year ago to stay on in London, but now it was a thousandfold more impossible to go home. Yet the thought gave him no peace by day or night. He had six men in his outfit, two of them half-breeds, and the journey was partly by canoe, with heavy portages, and partly on foot with the stores and pack-loads. It rained in torrents, the river was in flood, and the first day they made a bare twenty miles. The half-breeds were tough old customers, but the other four were not much to bank on. And on the third day, when they had to hump their packs and foot it on a bad trail through swampy woods and a cloud of flies, they decided they'd had enough. There was a new gold area just open not so far away, and they announced that they intended to help themselves to what they wanted from the stores and then make a beeline for the mines. They were an ugly type of tough, and had physically the upper hand of Jim and his half-breeds. It was a nasty situation, and it shook Jim out of his private vexations, he spoke them fair, and proposed to make camp and rest for a day to talk it out. Privately, he sent one of the half-breeds ahead to the survey party for help, while he kept his ruffians in play. Happily, he had some whiskey with him, and he had them drinking and playing cards which took him well into the afternoon. Then they discovered the half-breed's absence, and couldn't believe Jim's yarn that he'd gone off to find fresh meat. His only chance was to bluff high, and since he didn't care much what happened to him, he succeeded. He went to bed that night with a tough beside him who had announced his intention of putting a bullet through his head if there was any dirty work. Some time after midnight, his messenger arrived with help, and fortunately his bedside companion's bullet went wide. The stores, a bit depleted, were safely delivered, and when Jim got back to his base, he received a solid cursing from his boss for his defective stewardship. But Malone concluded with one of his rare compliments. You'll train on, Sonny. He said, 
There's guts in you for all your goo-goo face. That episode put an end to Jim's indecision. His time in Canada had been one long chapter of black disasters, and he was confident that they were now sent to him as a punishment. His last adventure had somehow screwed up his manhood. He hated Canada like poison, but the thought of going back to England made him green with apprehension. Yet he was clear that he must do it or never have a moment's peace. So he wrote to me and told me that for a year he'd been considering things, had come to the conclusion that he'd behaved like a cad. He was coming back to get into any kind of harness I directed, and would I advance him thirty pounds for his journey? Now the little company we'd put together to nurse the wreckage of Halberds had been doing rather well. One or two things had unexpectedly turned up trumps. There was enough money to keep the maiden aunts going, and it looked as if there would be a good deal presently for Jim. He had gone off leaving no address, so I had no means of communicating with him. I cabled him a hundred pounds and told him to come along. One afternoon near the end of June, he turned up in my office. He had crossed the Atlantic steerage, and his clothes were those of a docker who had been months out of work. The first thing he did was to plank eighty pounds in my desk. "'You sent me too much,' he said. "'I don't want to owe more than's necessary. "'You can stop the twenty quid out of my wages.' "'At first sight I thought him very little changed in face. "'He was incredibly lean and tanned, and his hair wanted cutting. "'But he had the same shy, hunted eyes as the boy who had bolted a year before. "'He didn't seem to have won any self-confidence, "'except that the set of his mouth was a little firmer. "'I want to start work at once,' he said. I've come home to make atonement. It took me a long time to make him understand the position of affairs, that he could count even now on a respectable income, and that if he put his back into it, Hallwards might again become a power in the city. I was only waiting for you to come back, I said, to revive the old name. Hallwards is a better sound than the Anglo-Orient Company. But I can't touch a penny, he said. What about the people who suffered through the bankruptcy? There were very few, I told him. None of the widow and orphan business. The banks were amply secured. The chief sufferers were your aunts and yourself, and that's going to be all right now. He listened with wide eyes, and slowly bewilderment gave place to relief, and relief to rapture. The first thing you've got to do, I said, is to go to your tailor and get some clothes. You'd better put up at a hotel till you can find a flat. I'll see about your club membership. If you want to play polo, I'll lend you a couple of ponies. "'Come and dine with me tonight and tell me your story.' "'My God!' he murmured. "'Do you realise that for a year I've been on my uppers? "'That's my story.' "'The rest of that summer Jim walked about in a happy mystification. "'Once he was decently dressed, I could see that Canada had improved him. "'He was better-looking, tougher, manlier. "'His shyness was now a wariness, "'and he'd got a new and sounder code of values. "'He worked like a beaver in the office.' and though he was curiously slow and obtuse about some things, I began to see he had his father's brains, and something, too, that old Halward had never had, a sensitive, subtle imagination. For the rest, he enjoyed himself. He'd come in for the end of the polo season, he was welcomed back to his old set as if nothing had happened. Then I ceased to see much of him. I had been overworking badly and needed a long holiday. So I went off to a Scotch deer forest in the middle of August and did not return till the beginning of October. Jim stuck tight to the office. He said he'd had all the holidays he wanted for a year or two. On the second day after my return, he came into my room and said that he wanted to speak to me privately. He wished, he said, that nothing should be done about restoring the name of Halwards. He would like the Anglo-Orient to go on just as it was before he returned and he didn't want the directorship which had been arranged. Why in the world? I asked in amazement. Because I'm going away, and I may be away for quite a time. When I found words, and that took some time, I asked if he'd grown tired of England. Bless you, no, I love it better than any place on earth. The autumn scents are beginning, and London is snugging down for its blessed cosy winter, and the hunting will soon be starting, and last Sunday I heard the old cock pheasants shouting, "'Where are you going? Canada?' "'He nodded. "'Have you fallen in love with it?' "'I hate it worse than hell,' he said solemnly, "'and proceeded to say things which, in the interests of imperial good feeling, "'I refrained from repeating. 
then you must be mad. No, he said, I'm quite sane. It's very simple, and I've thought it all out. You know, I ran away from my duty 18 months ago. Well, I was punished for it. I was a howling failure in Canada. I haven't told you half. I pretty well starved. I couldn't hold down any job. I was simply a waif and a laughing stock. And I loathed it. My God, how I loathed it. But I couldn't come back. The very thought of facing London gave me a sick pain. It took me a year to screw up my courage to do what I knew was my manifest duty. Well, I turned up, as you know. Then it's all right, isn't it? I observed obtusely. You find London better than you thought. I find it paradise, he smiled sadly. But it's a paradise I haven't deserved. You see, I made a failure in Canada, and I can't let it go at that. I hate the very name of the place and most of the people in it. Oh, I dare say there's nothing wrong with it, but one always hates a place where one has been a fool. I have to go back and make good. I shall take two hundred pounds, just what I had when I first started out. I only stared, and he went on. I funked once, and that may be forgiven. But a man who funks twice is a coward. I funk Canada like the devil, and that is why I'm going back. There was a man there, only one man, who said I had guts. I am going to prove to the whole damned dominion that I've guts, but principally I've got to prove it to myself. After that I'll come back to you, and then we'll talk business. I could say nothing. Indeed, I didn't want to say anything. Jim was showing a kind of courage several grades ahead of old Jonah's. He had returned to Nineveh and found that it had no terrors and was now going back to Tarshish, Wales and all.